want to get into another topic, data. And the business you're in, you get lots of data. And I'm pretty sure that you are probably hyper-focused on data, understanding data, um, and, and hopefully not constantly looking at data all the time. Uh, what kind of data do you look at in your business? What are some changes and variations and nuances to the data that inspire you to take action or to do something you know, we've talked in the past, uh, even when it comes to media, people changing the graphic, changing the headline, rewriting the first paragraph, the first sentence, the, you know, and then honestly, they know that if they don't get 10,000 views in an hour, that thing is gone and it's been replaced and now they're measuring again. So talk to us about data in your industry and what your company specifically looks at. The main data that we are looking at is really the customer's data. Uh, as mentioned, all customers are called members because you have to register. And so you give a lot of uh, personal information uh, to become a member of on the list. This, the reason is because we work with luxury brands and they want to know who's coming. They want also to avoid any resale uh, because it's all about the image of the brand. And at the end of the day, they want to invite people that are not already customers to uh, avoid any cannibalization. So uh, all data, it's all about customers. Of course, we have a lot of metrics behind uh, about sales and, and how we can make sure that we invite the right people to the sales to optimize. So the, K the KPI that we are working with the brand is the sell flow. So out of uh, thousands of products that we receive for sale, how many will be able to sell? And that's uh, uh, the, the main objective of every single event we organize. And for that, it's understanding who is going to be invited and, and to reassure the brands that we're working with. So it can be about the purchasing history, uh, what brands uh, or members bought in the past, similar positioning of brands. Uh, it can be categories of products, it can be sizes. Uh, so we, we have really unlimited data. Uh, and, uh, and at the end of the day, brands, they are always looking for new customers. So that's uh, one of the reasons why they work with Fondelist is because uh, if I take just the example of Hong Kong, we have 470,000 members that live in Hong Kong come to on the list regularly. Uh, and for some brands, we might only target for top, top members. We don't necessarily need to open to everyone. Uh, and this is super reassuring for them because they know that they can clear, uh, sell uh, all the excess inventory in a, a really discreet way. Uh, they don't have to destroy, they don't have to dispose it in, a, in, a, in the old habits that uh, they used to do. Uh, and, and for them, it's also getting some source of revenue. But most important for them is also to, uh, to, to tap to a new customer profile uh, that at the end will discover the product and uh, might be able to uh, then more and more go to the, the stores and, and discover the latest uh, uh, collections and, and, and become maybe a full price customer. Right, because you're... So their accounting, their budgets are built off of sales and revenues that don't involve on the list. By the time your partners arrive at on the list, they have, you're, you're a bit of a, a, obviously a secondary market, but you know, their, um, their finances have kind of been achieved. They're, they've measured what they wanted to do the way that they do it all that kind of stuff. So now maybe it's less about making money, but more about saving expenses and gaining more customers and gaining market share or gaining brand evangelism into some sub markets that they don't typically are in stuff like that right so am i putting that together correctly yeah and in addition what i was sharing before it's also uh for top brands uh, uh, and, um, a way to also reward the teams so usually when we organize an event, the, the staff, the employees of the brand will be first to come so that they have the access to all the inventory at this big discount. So it's a, it's really a privilege for them. And, and so uh, that's why, as you mentioned, it's less as a revenue uh, objective, but more as a, how to create a, an event and, 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 and some like excitement around, around this. Right. Okay. So they get, uh, 
they get they get in two hours before uh, you know it goes public, and uh, they have an opportunity to go through and shop uh, for themselves. Uh, okay, I like that. I like that a lot. And, uh, and to on. to to your example before about uh, data, uh, we know exactly after a few seconds uh, when we open an online sale. Uh, if it's going to be successful or not, because uh, with mm. the traffic online, like if we have hundreds of thousands of people visiting at that moment, uh, we can, uh, after a few minutes, we see uh, orders coming in. And so if we have thousands of orders uh, uh, within a few minutes, it means that uh, we'll have a high sell through and, and the event will be successful. If for, well, for whatever reason, we see that there's traffic, but the conversion is not there, then we can play uh, quickly on the pricing, on the communication, on maybe trying to, to uh, make the, the offer more appealing. Uh, so that's where we need to be reactive and, and, and to know well the data and, and, and to know what can work. Uh, so to, to put in place new actions uh, is really important. So yeah, data is, is really key on, on our job. What of that activity that you launch into when, like if, 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 if something is gonna go brilliantly, great then you just let it go and you know the inventory sells out and that's awesome but if it doesn't and now you're into the data now we need to see what's going on specific to that area of the world what do you find helps re-engage that level of sales to back to where you want what has been the success change the successful changes that you start to do that are specific to maybe that area of the world that might be different than maybe in the West that might be surprising to be like, maybe it's the graphic, maybe it's the price, maybe it's the something, you know, you said the communication, the story, what have you. Um, I'm wondering if there's something that we can tease out for our listeners that's specific to that area of the world that maybe brand owners in the West might not think would work as well as you have found works really well for that area. An example I was given when we started, so seven years ago, is that uh, tycoons in Hong Kong, uh, when they go to the shopping uh, luxury malls, uh, they always ask for free parking. So I think everyone worldwide is savvy and, and they like discounts, but I think it's even more the case in Asia and, 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 and they have this feeling of being smart, of being okay, I'm in the know-how, I'm, I'm part of this, uh, of uh, this specific group, uh, so that's why it's members only, and uh, and 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 people feel proud to to be able to get access to those discounts and to the best deals in town. So uh, to your point, yeah, prices are, are the most uh, important uh, is the most important uh, metric uh, because it's where we can play. So of course we need to convince the brand that we we work with, but we cannot uh, change the offer in terms of products because at the end is what it's left. So it's what didn't sell in stores. Uh, we we can change a little bit on the on the on the communication side and, and try to provide content, to produce videos, pictures that are more appealing. But people, when they come to the sale, uh, either on physical sales at the showrooms or uh, online, uh, they know pretty well what they're looking for. They know the brand uh, and and what will really trigger the, the the buying is the discounts. And if the prices are really good. Uh, people immediately click because otherwise they know that they will miss this opportunity mm. and who knows when it's coming back. Uh, and so that's why uh, uh, prices, uh, the price strategy is uh, something that uh, we have a dedicated team uh, and uh, yeah, this team is working hand in hand with the brands so that we can make sure that uh, at the end, again, the, the sell through is optimized uh, because the brands just want to, to, to sell as much as possible of the inventory that we have. Are you using any AI to looking at it because <laughs> I uh, would think that you can hire people to sit there and hammer away things and, and try to see and recognize, but they would be slow compared to AI. I mean, it's almost like, Hey, you know, chat GPT, we're going to use uh, We're going to be selling, you know, these shoes and what price do you think we should, you know, have it listed at for the first 10 seconds? Um, you know, it's, it's almost getting to the point where, um, they, you know, you could, you could automate or, you know, artificially, uh, intelligize intellect. I don't know. Uh, the first 10 seconds of price changes, right? Have that. So, moment. so the, there are different tools The they work well when you have a kind of ongoing offer, 
when you have uh, similar products, similar brands, similar prices, uh, and 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 so they can really understand and 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 and, and get uh, uh, better and better because it's on the same basis. Us, as we work with so many different positioning of brands, like some are super high in luxury and ten thousands of dollars of US dollars. Some others, we 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 send flip flops, not to mention any brand uh, that are only <laughs> dozens of dollars. Um, uh, that's why um, it's hard to have uh, something kind of automatized and and the human uh, uh, know how about also okay this brand is super popular uh, never been on discounts they don't have outlets uh, factory outlets uh, so you don't need to discount too much uh, while well, okay uh, here we are selling pants we know pants is harder to sell uh, so we need to really discount more on this category. Uh, so there's still a human touch that mm. we didn't, we were not able to find a way to replace it. Maybe there will be tools to help and, and we're already working with different tools. But uh, uh, I believe in all model, the variety of products is so wide that uh, uh, it, it's hard to, to make it completely replaced by AI. But uh, if any auditors is listening and, and have a solution and, and we are we are looking at it and, and we are uh, more on the IT side or customer service, uh, I think ChatGPT will, will offer a lot of uh, improvement and, and, and will help uh, our teams to work better. Uh, on the really price strategy side, I, I'm not that convinced. Right. Uh, and, you know, I mean, as long as you're, even if it's not there yet, it still behooves anybody, I think anybody listening, uh, collect your data. Um, have good, clean data mm -hmm. storage because... AI is only as good as the data that it has to use. Mm -hmm. And so when it ever, if and when does become really, really important and useful, you're gonna have to have all of that, you know, you're gonna have to feed the monster, right? So you're gonna have to have the food ready for it when it, you know, when it's here. So uh, just because it's not here yet, doesn't mean you shouldn't be collecting all the, all the data to give it. Um, what are the top five regions in all of APAC that uh, on the list sells into? Hong Kong. Uh, so we different greater China in, in different markets. So we have uh, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, um, and from Hong Kong, we deliver to Macau. Uh, so this is still uh, the, the biggest. Uh, Singapore, uh, it's also a, a big market for us where we have a, a permanent showroom. And then the growing markets that we started during COVID, where we was mainly online, it's uh, South Korea and Australia and Malaysia. And we are opening soon Thailand uh, because the brands are, are developing there uh, extremely uh, rapidly and, and uh, uh, they have really top, top performing uh, stores there. And, and so they have more and more inventory in those markets. And, and depending on the markets, sometimes you have customs. So it means that uh, the inventory sent there it's kind of blocked because you have to pay again uh, if you want to exit, like to uh, export uh, whatever uh, stock inventory you have there. So, so that's why they're asking us to uh, help them uh, in, on those markets. Okay. How, again, for our listeners, educating them about that entire area of the world, specific to what you do. Can you talk a bit about the differences between some of those different regions, things you may have had to do differently or how you find the customers interact differently or purchase differently that that customer journey is a little bit different can you talk a little bit about the differences between the regions if you just take china it's completely a different ecosystem everything is on wechat uh, uh you you have to operate just completely on a, on a different uh, mindset uh while uh, in hong kong singapore is still by email so it's classic uh, what we know more in, in the US and Europe, uh, like the Western world, uh, like about the, the big flashers operators. So we send emails and, and that's how we drive traffic. Uh, while in China is completely different. Korea also has a, a really uh, different uh, ecosystem uh, based on neighbor and, and different uh, big online uh, players where people are going, uh, Kakao Talk also. Um, so yeah, I think every single market has a, its specificities and that's why it's important to localize and to have uh, either partners or directly your teams uh, that uh, know well the markets and, and can uh, adopt and, and, and make sure that your, your business model uh, uh, corresponds to, to the reality of, uh, of the people in this market. Okay. 
What do you think is, you know, and I know, no crystal ball. This is only going to be your opinion, but I want to talk about the future of retail in Asia. How do you see on the list adapting to swiftly changing consumer behaviors and market trends going forward? But first, luxury in Asia is booming and will continue for, for there's no reasons why. And when we just see the reopening of Macau and Hong Kong, uh, it's really massive. Uh, it's just incredible the figures that the brands are able to achieve. Um, so, so this trend about uh, like really the appetite of consumers uh, in Asia for 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 those top brands, uh, it's it's definitely there and it's even growing. Uh, there's a lot of middle class people in those markets that uh, are dreaming to access those brands, and and so that, that means new customers, uh, and 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 it's a big big part of the population. And, and, and here there's half of the population worldwide. So uh, that's why uh, brands are really focusing the investment uh, in Asia, not only China, but uh, uh, even uh, at the luxury symposium uh, last week, a uh, big conference, uh, people were talking about India. Uh, so it's not our plan yet uh, for the list to open India, but uh, just to share uh, like, uh, what the brands are, are mentioning. Um, and, and, and at the end, um, what, what those brands are good at it's of course they have fantastic products but they also uh, sell a story uh, they sell dreams uh, and and people here they, they love that like they want to escape uh, particularly after covid where it was not an easy uh, day-to-day life uh, they want to be able to uh, to to yeah uh, to be to be in a in a part of uh, this this fantastic world of luxury brands and uh, they've been really strong and great at doing it, and and that's why uh, uh, people always want to have excitement, want to uh, to be able to yeah to to be proud of wearing something that uh, is is nice. So I think uh, that there is no doubt that uh, this market will be continue to to grow a lot uh, in this region. Okay, cool. You have a showroom in Hong Kong. How has that helped your business? And furthermore, what do you think is the future, in your opinion, of offline retail? So we have showrooms in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Singapore. Mm-hmm. Uh, really important for two sides. First, uh, the, the brands, uh, most of the luxury brands, they, they, they feel uh, it's more on the control when they do a physical sale. Uh, because they can send the teams there, they can be at the entrance, at the cashier, so they know exactly what's happening, even though we can put exactly the same processes online. But because they are here, they, they feel uh, more <laughs> secure. Um, and then for the customers, for under these members, uh, it's also uh, give more authenticity about the products that we're selling, uh, reassurance that we are working directly with the brand, that there's no doubt about where the product is coming from, because online, but there's a lot of parallel. Uh, and this is something with Delphine that we've been always uh, putting in priority that we only work with the brands or the official distributors. That's why we can use the logos. We can use the official trademarks. Uh, and, and there's really no doubt about where the product is coming from. And in Asia, there's still a big doubt. Uh, all the big platforms, uh, there's sometimes fakes. There is uh, products that are not uh, as qualitative as they should be. And, 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 and for us, but there's no doubt because we work with the brands, but how we can translate that to uh, the, the customers of on the list or members uh, by having this physical showroom uh, reassures them a lot. Um, and to your question about in general about the retail market, uh, luxury, it's about experience and, and you can have a good experience online. Uh, NetApporté, a lot of platforms gave a, a really a good uh, uh, Farfetch now also is doing an amazing job in that sense with pri- pri- private clientele. Uh, but still, it will never replace the, the experience you can get in store, the service that uh, uh, the, the, the teams are super trained, uh, that, that there's a lot of efforts from the brands to really educate well the teams to, to serve and to share uh, about the storytelling uh, uh, behind every single product. Uh, and, and it's super hard to tell that story online. Uh, so that's why it's still uh, uh, like more than 80% of total sales are done in brick and mortars. Uh, and it's brands are talking about omni channel because it means that people are going online, they get access to some information, then they go to the stores. Um, so it's the whole experience that is important. Uh, and, and 
why people are buying online is for the convenience. Uh, for us, when we work with some brands, people are super happy to buy it online because then they get delivered. They don't need to come to the showroom. But still, for high-end brands, uh, but people are, are happy to come and when it sizes, when when you want to touch the fabric, when you really want to to see the product, uh, the, the physical will never be replaced by online. Yeah, no, it it really can't. I mean, there's no technology out there available uh, right now. I mean, you could you could do some sort of 3D imaging of yourself and some some holographic, and you can put it on, and you can you know say some things. But it really is just, um, yeah, we're just not there yet. I think to for the level of confidence, especially the more important the purchase. Um, I think the more that people feel what they wear and how it looks and how it fits and how that brand represents who they aspire to be, you just can't, you know, you're not going to put something or wear something that doesn't fit right, no matter how amazing the brand or the quality or the material. If it doesn't fit you right and it's not making you look the way that you want to look, still not going to wear it. So it is a difficult thing to overcome. I want to talk a little bit about COVID. How, what was your experience with COVID? How did you, you know, what did you guys go through? How, how, what was the impact for you guys? A lot, a lot of up and downs. Uh, the, the downs were linked to the restrictions. Uh, Shanghai was closed three months last year. Uh, impossible to operate uh, at the showroom and even online, like the, show, the, the warehouse that we work with was completely closed. Uh, so we had no revenue and zero uh, subsidies. Uh, so that was a not an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, a lot of uh, opportunities because brands they were having more and more inventory. Uh, they needed also to, to get some, some cash. And so we were uh, able to develop a, a, a lot of new online solutions for the brands, uh, for staff sales or to be able to uh, target specific uh, uh, markets uh, doing like uh, more cross-border events. So at the end, it's uh, again to listen to to the needs of the partners and 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 try to adapt the offer. Uh, and yeah, today we are we in a position where we we survive COVID and and we know that uh, we strengthen the link uh, the partnership with the brands. Uh, we we thank them to to uh, gave us uh, one more opportunity to work with them and and I think. Uh, uh, yeah, um, it, it was needed to be reactive, to be uh, resilient, to to be agile. We we had at one moment to, unfortunately, to to reduce a little bit uh, the scale, uh, and 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 so we 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 had to separate some some team members, and and, and that was not uh, as an entrepreneur and mm -hmm. first time we were facing this. It was not uh, the the easiest uh, period of our life uh, as a as a business, but uh, uh, now we're growing again, and and so. Uh, uh, yeah, I think COVID, uh, if, if you take it in the right way, the, any challenge, uh, you, you find opportunities out of it. Yeah, I think goal number one was survive. And those who survived had a very good chance to thrive. Um, you know that we're getting to the point of moving past COVID, even for me, because two years ago, COVID was at the top of my list of things to talk about. And now it is it's it's nicely down at the bottom and i hope pretty soon it doesn't even make the list um diego you know we usually ask for a couple of names of people that you know people you respect that that live and work and have you know professional careers in that area of the world hopefully not in the exact same vertical because we've already talked to you we got everything we need to know we don't need to talk to somebody else uh a carbon copy of yourself but would you mind giving us one or two names on the air so to speak of people that you think would make uh really interesting guests especially just for the audience uh, a couple of people that the audience could probably learn a lot from as they have from you here today that you wouldn't mind uh calling them out and then, of course, we can uh, go after them on social and say, oh, hey, by the way, Diego called you out on the podcast. You should go give it a listen. And maybe you'd like to be a guest as well. But do you have a couple of people for us? 
Uh, of course, I, I can try. Uh, then uh, I don't know if uh, they will be uh, available to to. But uh, you've mentioned just before we we started to record uh, that uh, you were a bit disappointed that Delphine was not joining today because yeah. you wanted more women. So I, yes. I can focus on on more <laughs> women, uh, maybe true. guests for you. Um, so I'm sorry for the audience also that uh, maybe they would have preferred to have Delphine today. Um, so I can name uh, Joanna. Uh, Joanna Monange. Uh, uh, started her own uh, fragrance brand called Maison 21G. Uh, we oh. work with them, but uh, it's an amazing brand uh, uh, about uh, uh, tailor-made fragrances. Uh, so they, they listen to the customer's preferences. And so you have a full uh, kind of one-to-one uh, um, uh, yeah. -one, uh, consultation. And then you, you go out with your personalized uh, fragrance and, and, and she's developing... Uh, uh, her brand in the region and and and, and doing an amazing Very job. Innovative, uh, cool. And it's all about data as well, just to understand better the customer. And and they do also a lot of B two B working with big corporates mm. uh, on giving like uh, team building experiences. Um, I feel like there's then like I, a twenty three and Me opportunity there, where I send in some like some hair and some 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 of my you know my nail clippings. And then they understand like my pheromones and my skin type. And then how is it going to actually smell once it's on my skin and it smell good? I feel like that's in the future. It's absolutely going to happen. <laughs> I'm not sure it's there yet, but I think uh, Joanna will be interested to hear your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. Ariane, uh, an inspiring uh, entrepreneur in Hong Kong uh, that... Uh, brought a lot of uh, top uh, contemporary brands from Europe uh, to because in Hong Kong it's a lot about luxury uh, less about you know the uh, inspiring premium brands that are not the same price point more uh, affordable uh, and and so she started Rue Madame uh, many years ago and, and and she's super successful a little bit like Arnaud Capoc that you received not that long ago mm -hmm. but focusing more on the women's uh, brands uh, she started Sandro Hommage and now she has Vanessa Bruno and many, uh, many cool brands uh, from France and Europe, uh, a lot uh, more and more uh, from the UK as well, Sweetie Betty and, and, and few others. Uh, then I don't know her directly, but you should try to talk to Rachel Lim from Love Bonito. I have a good friend working for her. Uh, so Love Bonito is a Singaporean brand focusing on Asian women. Uh, because the shape of women in Asia are not necessarily the same. Mm -hmm. And so she mm -hmm. felt, okay, uh, why no one is really targeting the Asian customer? And uh, so Rachel, a uh, really inspiring woman. Uh, again, I, I never met her, but uh, uh, Maxime, a good friend, uh, we, we might be able to connect her, uh, you with her. Um, and then, yeah, I have a, a lot of different friends, entrepreneurs in, in Hong Kong, Shanghai, or or Singapore, you can also try to talk to Alexi Bonham from Farfetch uh, because uh, they're doing an amazing job uh, for luxury uh, online uh, worldwide and, and particularly in Asia. Well, I am I'm happy to <laughs> give you a few names and then you can pick from them. Yeah, that's amazing. I, You know, I think there's a lot of really amazing, interesting, you know, I, I think even for those expats that we get to talk to as well, um, just to be an expat, just to go out of your comfort zone, out of your home country, go to another place in the world. You're almost an entrepreneur by nature because you have already physically taken yourself out of the most comfortable place you could be and gone to another place, which is just by default going to be more uncomfortable than where you were. And being an entrepreneur is about almost facing the uncomfortable and getting used to it and then starting to survive and thrive in that in that thing. So I, I just think that people who are expats are, are in some way, shape or form, they've got entrepreneur in their DNA. Uh, and I love talking to these people. And uh, I was super, super impressed and, and honored to be able to talk to you here today. We will definitely chase down all of those people that you mentioned. I think they would be wonderful guests. I think that anybody you think of, you can throw our way if you think that, hey, you guys should go on this podcast too. Uh, anybody in the audience listening, if you have any suggestions of people that you know who you think would like to be on the podcast or people that you know of or potentially follow and you would want to hear them on the podcast, throw their names our way and we will go chase them down and hunt them down for you. Because really at the end of the day, this podcast is really just all about 
you, the audience, and trying to help you better understand Asia as a whole through anecdotal and hopefully interesting education, inspiring conversations with people like Diego Deltson, co-founder of On The List. Diego, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you, Ted. It was a pleasure right. talking to you today. For all of you who are watching on the YouTube channel, don't forget if you need your hands uh, or your eyes for other things, we have the podcast, as I usually say. I usually just say it a lot cleaner than that. Uh, so go listen to the podcast. Um, and if, for those of you listening to the podcast only and you want to see Diego and I talking here live on video, of course, you can go to the WPIC YouTube channel and find the recording there. Uh, for everybody at WPIC, my partner, Eddie Tabachman, who puts on this show in the background. And thank you, Diego, for coming on the show as well. And to all our audience members who are here, please don't forget to subscribe, to like, to comment, to reach out. Uh, just let us know what we're doing well or what we can improve on. We're always eager to hear from you. Uh, but from all of us, including Diego, thanks very much for listening to the show. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.